Good evening. My name is Pauline Rockman and is co-president of the Jewish Holocaust Center and a member of the Australian delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It gives me great pleasure to be introducing Professor Marcia Layton Alien as the keynote speaker for International Holocaust Remembrance Day 2019. The Jewish Holocaust Center has been involved in presenting this annual event to the community since the United Nations Proclamation of 2005. From 2016, we have hosted this event jointly with the Jewish Community Council of Victoria. The Jewish Holocaust Center mission is to commemorate the Holocaust and to educate widely to combat anti-Semitism, racism and prejudice. But the center is much more than that. We have a commitment to truth-telling in an age when the truth is being routinely challenged. A commitment to teaching compassion, to counter indifference, intolerance and inhumanity. And a commitment to fostering respect, civility and inclusivity. On the occasion of International Holocaust Remembrance Day and the 74th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, German and Nazi concentration camp. The Italian chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, Ambassador Sandro de Bernardino, stresses the importance of countering the distortion and safeguarding the historic record, which makes Professor Lanton here tonight a perfect speaker for this special event. Professor Marcia Lanton is a leading academic and Indigenous spokesperson who has held the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since 2000. She is a member of the Aboriginal Bijara Nation and is an anthropologist and geographer. She has researched Indigenous relationships with place, land tenure and environmental management, agreement making and treaties in the Northern Territory and Cape York Peninsula. She has produced a large body of knowledge in the areas of political and legal anthropology, Indigenous agreements and engagements with the minerals industry and Indigenous culture and art. During the 1970s, she was active in the anti-relation movement, drawing attention to the oppression of women. She has appeared in film and television portraying strong Indigenous characters. She has made a significant contribution to government and non-government policy, as well as to Indigenous studies at three universities. Langton's work in anthropology and the advocacy of Aboriginal rights was recognised in 1993, when she was made a member of the Order of Australia. She was awarded the Inaugural Member of Honor Award for Indigenous Teacher of the Year in 2002. She's a fellow of the Academy of Social Science in Australia, a fellow of Trinity College, Melbourne, and an honorary fellow of New York College at the University of Queensland. In 2016, Professor Lanton was honored as a University of Melbourne Redford Valley Distinguished Professor. In further recognition as one of Australia's most respected Indigenous academics, Professor Lanton was appointed in 2017 as the first University Provost University of Melbourne. Marcia spoke, chose a very topical issue to present to us this evening. She will be exploring Australian standards on racial, ethnic and religious discrimination and vilification and asking the questions, do we have sufficient protection against the global rise of far-right hate movements? I'm delighted to invite her to the podium. Of this land where we meet. 
the words of people and their elders. I pay my respects to them and observe that I'm not here by right, but only with their permission. I want to acknowledge the presence of an important elder here tonight, Uncle Boydie, Mr. Alfred Turner of the Yorta Yorta people. He is the grandson of Yorta Yorta elder, Mr. William Cooper, who led a protest in Melbourne against the actions of the Nazis during the Christian Park problems in Germany and Austria in 1938. been honoured by the Jewish Holocaust Centre and by the wider Jewish community. He is here tonight with his daughter and great-granddaughter William Cooper, Mrs Leonie Drummond. It is an honour for me to be invited to deliver this address in remembrance of the Holocaust. I honour the memory of the six million Jews, thousands of Rom, homosexuals, political opponents of Nazism, communists, intellectuals, artists and writers, the disabled, the twins, and especially the children, all the victims of the Holocaust. I acknowledge the victims of the Shoah who are present here this evening, and also family members and descendants of Holocaust victims who are here this evening. I should say a little about myself. I grew up in Queensland where my grandfather's people the Yiman or Iman were almost exterminated by white vigilantes and by the cruel racist regime of the Queensland governments. Through persistence, I've slowly learned how descendants like myself are here to this day. So it's a special honour for me to be with you this evening. In his statement this year, Judge Thomas Boedenthal delivered the 2000 uh, sorry, last year, delivered the 2018 Learn Holocaust Remembrance Day keynote address. I want to cite his closing remarks because this must be a central motive for our remembrance and our duty in marking this terrible date. By honouring the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, we commit ourselves to never again allow any human beings to become the victims of genocides in any part of the world. This must be the watchword of all Holocaust Remembrance Days. As already explained, the United Nations theme of the Holocaust Remembrance and Education Activities this year is Holocaust Remembrance, Demand and Defending of Human Rights. The UN observance <coughs> calls for youth to learn from the lessons of the Holocaust, act against discrimination and defend democratic values in their communities at a time when the spread of neo-Nazism and hate groups fuels the rise of anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred around the world. The theme highlights the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. I also cite a statement by UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Z. Grad al Hussein, on the Holocaust Remembrance and Education, our shared responsibility. As Simone Gail, a heroic French survivor of Auschwitz who died last summer once said, our legacy is in your hands. The task of vigilance is yours. The shower was unique in the history of humanity, but the poison of racism, anti-Semitism and the rejection of the other and hatred are not limited to any one era, culture or people. To varying degrees and in various forms there have been daily threats everywhere and always in the past and in the new century that dawns. Our testimony calls on you to embody and defend the democratic values rooted in absolute respect for human dignity, which are our most precious legacy. And uh, as I went on even today, perhaps especially today, these messages need to be absorbed by a growing number of world leaders who view human rights as a tiresome constraint. Nationalists are once again stirring up discrimination, hatred and violence against vulnerable scapegoats, seeking to profit from messages of ethnic or religious supremacy. Across the world, many people are suffering atrocities and mass campaigns of killings. International human rights law is being violent, violated and undermined. 
I followed the work of the late Simon Weil and other courageous Jewish leaders for hints as to how my people, the first Australians, could seek relief and redress from the conflagration that followed British colonisation of our lands. I was encouraged by his work and found moral, legal and philosophical support for our own attempts to protect and regain our property, our attempts at compensation for theft and other crimes against us and for justice for the victims. I want to thank the many Jewish people, especially those here in Melbourne who have assisted us over many years and in so many ways. In the limited time I have, I should name just a few whose generosity of spirit and deep understanding of our common humanity has touched me in my own work and supported First Australians in Civil and Human Rights, made the title, the Arts, Education and Scholarship, and so much more. The late Emil and Hannah Whitten, the late Dr Peter Ucko, Dr Colin Tatz, Mr Mark Liebler, the late Mr Ron Caston, Professor Leon Mann, Late Mr. Richard Pratt, Mrs. Jeannie Pratt, the Honourable James Spiegelman, Mr. Colin Golden, the Carmen family, Justice Mordecai Bromberg, Mr. and Mrs. Maria and Anna Schwartz, but there are many others. My contribution here to the international efforts to remember the Holocaust and to deliver on the commitments of the United Nations Convention on Genocide is to reflect on Australian standards on racial, ethnic and religious discrimination and vilification. I've asked myself this question many times recently, as you would have. Do we have sufficient protection against the global rise of far-right hate movements? The simple answer to this question is, and many have said this before and frequently on this day throughout the last 74 years, we must be eternally vigilant. Yet, it is not simple. We must build and maintain institutions and programs to fight the organised hate and violence of Nazism, racism and genocide. We must teach the young to beware the messengers of this hate. We must compensate the victims. We must develop laws to prevent these atrocities. With this theme of this day of remembrance, our work to educate the young is ever more urgent. Professors of Harvard Gross, Chairholder Minister, Chair in Education for Human Values, Tolerance and Peace, School of Education, Bar Ilan University, has reminded us in introducing the discussion papers for Holocaust education that the establishment of a robust remembrance and education program was the expression of a commitment by the United Nations to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust would be passed on to future generations. He stated, the United Nations also recognised its responsibility to highlight the vital educational issues of global citizenship and human rights, which today are as pressing as ever, if not more so. It acknowledges the need to develop a new cosmopolitan memory of the Holocaust that transcends ethnic and national boundaries, a memory that is not only connected to the past, but also to a common future. A murky wave of xenophobia, racism and hatred is flooding the world and educators must mobilise to resist it. I fear that our domestic institutional and legal landscape for the fight against anti-Semitism, race hate and support of violence and pursuit of ethnic hatreds are insufficient. I believe that there is much more that we should do. Some of you will know that there was a finding of genocide by the Australian Human Rights Commission inquiry into the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families, especially in relation to uh, one cause, conducted by the late Sir Ronald Wilson and Mr Michael Dodson. Michael Dodson's older brother became the chair of the Australian Reconciliation Council in 1992. He is now a senator. In his Vincent Liniari lecture delivered in Darwin in 1993, he reminded us of this. The National Human Rights Commission inquiry into the practice of removing the children from their mothers, their people, their country, their culture, described this activity as genocide. The nation has still not come to terms with this reality. And then he continued, the stolen generations must try their luck in the courts with the same sincerely regretful government will continue to oppose them. Those individual Aboriginal people who were taken away now have to prove that it was real, that they were lucky to have survived. Perhaps this inability to seize the moment highlights just how entrenched the assimilation mindset is 
when the agencies of government are confronted with the realities of how Aboriginal peoples were treated by governments. Reconciliation is a matter that takes place at different levels, if it takes place at all. The quality of our reconciliation will be dependent upon our capacity to embrace all its aspects, how dif however difficult each may seem. First, there is the personal level. If there is ignorance, hostility, discrimination or racism experienced, then reconciliation will mean very little. But if there is concern, solidarity, inclusiveness and some respect, then reconciliation will have some positive responses. The importance of reconciliation will range up and down over how any of these encounters dominates in the lives of both people, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. Then there is the reconciliation at the social level. These are the social policy matters that have to do with health, housing, education and employment, welfare and an economic base. Reconciliation here is about whether the particular government or the Aboriginal peoples themselves have done enough or anything to relieve the concerns that hit Aboriginal people so hard every day. It is also about the shared responsibilities and obligations we have in this society. Then there is the reconciliation of government, governments. This is about governments making laws that remove rights or enhance them. Fundamentally, it is about the content of the legislative enactments that affect or impact upon the Aboriginal peoples. Finally, there is the reconciliation of recognition. The sovereign position that Aboriginal peoples assert has never been ceded. Recognition starts from the premise that terra nullius and its consequences were imposed upon the Aboriginal peoples. And certainly there was never any choice given to the Aboriginal peoples concerning the constitution or the rule of law. To have any substantial reconciliation, we must encompass all these aspects, no matter how challenging they may seem. These foundations cannot be made on concrete that lacks the binding mortar of truth. Many years later, after opposition from John Howard's hostile government, Kevin Rudd, while he was Prime Minister, delivered the apology to the stolen generations. Yet proper restitution remains out of the reach of the survivors without painful and expensive litigation. None of the other matters that now Senator Dodson raised a quarter of a century ago have gone away. Each one of the matters he raised remain issues of the highest priorities, of the highest priority, a concern all of us. The need for reconciliation remains a high priority, as does a proper act of restitution to the stolen generations, and a meaningful commitment to never repeat this policy of removing Aboriginal children from their families for the purposes of assimilation or eliminating Aboriginal people as a distinct group. The state and territory governments, however, continue to remove children at an astonishing rate, and New South Wales the New South Wales government has passed legislation that removes them permanently from their families. There is one act, the Racial Discrimination Act, that has been effective in a formal sense in protecting us from race hate and vilification. Although the history of this legislation tells us that our vigilance to ensure that it is not breached will necessarily involve litigation, complaints, lobbying and our votes. The spirit of the Racial Discrimination Act has been breached several times in the last few years in ways that I could not, could not have thought possible. I will cite only a few, and I'm sure that you could offer many more. In October last year, one of the slogans of the organised international white supremacist movement, and especially the Ku Klux Klan, It's OK to be White, was moved in a resolution by Senator Pauline Hanson in the Australian Senate. Not once, but twice. It was narrowly defeated by three votes. A majority of the Liberal and National Party senators supported it. Among those in government who supported the motion were the Deputy Senate Leader and Trade Minister Simon Birmingham, Indigenous Affairs Minister Nigel Scullion, Deputy National Leader Bridget McKenzie and Senator Lucy Kichuhi. The excuse by the government for this appalling <coughs> support for a well-known racist slogan was that it was an administrative error by a client. I do not accept this, and even if it were true, this excuse is an exacerbation of an already alarming breach of the standards expected of our parliamentarians. In August last year, in his maiden speech, Senator Fraser Annan called for a return to the White Australia policy, a return to a European Christian immigration system, and a ban on Muslim migrate, Muslims migrating to Australia. 
Moreover, he used the term to find a solution. That he was not stopped from continuing this speech and that senators from the government side embraced him affectionately and praised him for this speech afterwards was a wake-up call to all of us. But the insidious creep of fascism into politics in Australia, as well as in many countries, has become a matter for our attention, a matter that requires us to fight against fascism in all its forms and to disdain the Australian tendency to trivialise this doctrine of hate and murder. Complicit in this trivialisation are many journalists in the Australian media. Our task of education clearly extends beyond the young and must include the media, our universities and public institutions, and especially our parliaments. But the business of government in the Senate will rely on Fraser Annan's vote in the coming months is deeply offensive to me and to many other Australians. How far our nation has drifted from the principles set out in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, as Annie Hansen and others deliver statement after statement in our parliament that offends against its basic principles. I have been a direct beneficiary of Australia's first federal human rights and anti-discrimination legislation, which was introduced as the Racial Discrimination Bill in the House of Representatives on 13 February 1975 by Kep Enderby as Attorney General. It came into force as the Racial Discrimination Act 1975 on 31 October 1975, my birthday. Um, a birthday, not the first one. Um, <laughs> Throughout my career, I have encountered at first hand people of different backgrounds who have sought protection and redress from racism and turned to this act, the RDA, often with success. As a victim of racism, I feel validated in the knowledge that this act sets a standard that envisages a world in which I will not be judged by the colour of my skin, but by the content of my character, and envisages, envisions a world in which people are not manacled by the chains of discrimination. This act had a powerfully transformative effect on the development of Australian law, human rights and Indigenous rights and on our society. A society once formally racist in several important ways and now much less so. The Act has been tested constitutionally and has been the subject of continuing public debate. Um, there are a hundred cases in the courts on the Racial Discrimination Act in its short history. Indeed, an increasingly strident and dangerous set of claims have emerged purporting that the RDA undermines a highly fictitious version of free speech. Many of these claims are unfounded and often irrational, and the claims of threats to freedom of speech nothing more than rancor and bitterness about the voices of the victims of racism and intolerance discrimination against people on the basis of their ethnic or national origin, rising occasionally above the noise of the crowd. Kep Enderby <coughs> recognised that legislation can only go so far in achieving a change which must ultimately come from within the minds of the people. He was president about this challenge. We have some way to go before his vision is realised. For instance, <coughs> The effect of this act on the development of the doctrine of native title is significant. Without it, native title might have been extinguished everywhere by federal and state extinguishing acts, such as the Queensland legislation that purported to extinguish native title and which was later ruled inconsistent with the RDA and thus invalid by the High Court. In Western Australia, similar legislation had been enacted to that overruled in the first Mabo judgment. However, it too was overruled in the High Court based on its inconsistency with provisions in the RDA. There were cases of racism pursued in the courts by Aboriginal plaintiffs long before the RDA came into effect. Also, there were other impacts of the RDA long before the landmark Mabo No. 2 case in the High Court and the hotly debated negotiations in 1992 and 1993 with Prime Minister Paul Keating and several key members of his cabinet and others in that parliament. The history of this act and the challenges to racial discrimination that relied on its terms in several case, cases should be the curriculum of civic education. 
An extraordinary body of literature about his history details the transition from a widely accepted public commitment to the white Australia policy to a healthy public scepticism about rancorous demands for a return to that era of our nation's history. John Kawata's commitment to justice led to him seeking the protection of the Racial Discrimination Act by litigating. This resulted in an important victory in 1982, a period victory at that time, but one that ended the draconian racism of the Queensland government, which had refused to transfer a past release title to him and other members of the Wenjinam group. The Kuala case laid the ground for the recognition of native title in past releases, a matter which John Kawada's neighbours, the Wikipaiol and other peoples pursued with the same determination. Successive Queensland state governments from the early 70s to the 90s used environmental conservation legislation and instruments to prevent Aboriginal groups from acquiring and using land. The most notorious of such actions was that taken against the late John Kawata of, of the Wichita group, Cape York. The Aboriginal Land Fund Commission had purchased on behalf of him and the group the Archer River Pastoral Holding, located on his traditional territory in central Cape York. In February 1976, Kawara and the Aboriginal Land Commission entered into a written contract with the lessees for the purchase of the lease, as well as the cattle and horses on the lease. However, the sale and transfer of the lease was subject to approval by the Minister for Lands of the State of Queensland, who used his authority to refuse the transfer. According to Collins, Queensland government policy, policy explicitly opposed proposals to acquire large areas of additional freehold land or leasehold land for development by Aborigines or Aboriginal groups in isolation. The government gazetted a number of national parks over pastoral properties that Aboriginal people had expressed interest in buying with the intent to prevent them from purchasing the land. In December 1976, the Minister for Land stated the reasons for refusing to grant approval or permission for such transfer. The question of the proposed acquisition of Archer River pastoral holding comes within the ambit of declared government policy expressed in Cabinet decision of September 1972, which stated the Queensland Government does not view favourably proposals to acquire, acquire large areas of additional freehold or leasehold land for development by Aborigines. In the light of this policy, um, there was a detailed report to State Cabinet. And the Cabinet confirmed that their policy remained unchanged. And it said in the minutes that in accordance with such policy, and as it is considered that sufficient land in Queensland is already reserved, and available for use and benefit Aborigines, no consent be given to the transfer of Archer River pastoral holding. Kawada appealed this decision to the High Court, citing the Racial Discrimination Act. He argued that the Queensland Government had breached this act by refusing to grant a lease to the Aboriginal Land Fund Commission. The High Court agreed, and in 1982, by a majority of four to three, upheld the Commonwealth's right to legislate for racial discrimination which they said came about when the Commonwealth had signed the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination pursuant to the external affairs power of the Australian Constitution. The case confirmed the Act's validity and the Commonwealth's power to ensure that state governments comply with it. More generally, it confirmed the Commonwealth's power to implement international treaty obligations, including human rights treaty obligations, into domestic law. In a cruel twist, Kawata and the Winchinung Group were never able to acquire title to their country as the Queensland Government had gazetted the lease area as a national park. They had, however, successfully opposed the racist intransigence of the LP Peterson Government and scored a very real victory in opposing racial discrimination. Indeed, the Kawata case is the first example of the Commonwealth using the external affairs power as the basis for legislation able to directly limit the actions of state governments. In the annals of the history of the RBA, this case was followed by Gary V. Brown, which further elaborated human rights law in Australia, with particular reference to special measure. The Pitjantjara Land Rights Act was enacted with the purpose of granting a large area of northwest South Australia to the Pitjantjara people. 
It provided that all Pitu and Jaraku have unrestricted rights of access to the lands, and that a person not being a Pitjantjara who enters the lands without the permission of Arnold or Pitjantjaraku is guilty of an offence and liable to a penalty. penalty. Mr Brown, who had entered the land without permission, was charged with this offence. His counsel argued in court that this act was inconsistent with the RDA and consequently invalid, and the case was eventually appealed to the High Court, which held that the South Australian Act was a special measure for the purposes of Section 8.1 of the RDA and consequently valid. non pitjantjara people could lawfully be excluded from the Pitjantjara lands. The judges unanimously agreed on the appropriateness of taking affirmative action for Aboriginal people and held that the land rights legislation was an appropriate remedial step for a disadvantaged racial group. I do not need to spell out the detail with regard to the facts and findings in Mabo No. 1 and Mabo No. 2 in the Supreme Court of Queensland and the High Court, respectively. To su suffice it to say that gay and racial discrimination act was critical to the outcome. The Queensland Government had passed the Queensland Coast Islands Declaratory Act in 1985. This act purported to extinguish whatever rights and interests the Merriam people might have had under their traditional law and to extinguish traditional rights retrospectively with effect from 1879 when Queensland annexed the islands and without compensation. By a majority, again, of four to three, the High Court held the Queensland Coast Islands Declaratory Act was invalid because it was inconsistent with the RDA. It discriminated against the Merriam people by purporting to extinguish any rights they might have in their land. The case confirmed that Section 10 of the RDA could render subsequent discriminatory state legislation invalid. It also drew attention to the discriminatory nature of the Queensland legislation and enabled Mabo No. 2 to go ahead. In June, 90, in June 1992, the High Court of Australia handed down its decision in Mabo, upholding by a majority of six to one the claims by the Merriam people to the Mare Island who sought to have their native title recognised in law. The High Court overturned 200 years of the legal fiction of terra nullius and established that customary rights to land had pre-existed and under certain conditions survived British sovereignty. The decision was a watershed. Conservative commentators labelled the decision due to judicial activism and condemned the court's findings. Um, you'll remember, perhaps, Richard Court, the Victorian Premier, Jeff Kennett, um, Hugh Morgan, Managing Director of Western Mining, uh, and indeed uh, the Deputy Premier, Tim Fisher, each one of them making more and more outrageous <coughs> statements about the decision and indeed the judges, all arguing that the Racial Discrimination Act should be repealed. And there were calls for a referendum on the issue. Despite this, in October 1992, Prime Minister Paul Keating announced his intention to seek Commonwealth legislation giving effect to the findings in Mabo. Eleven months of intense debate and negotiation followed. The Australian Mining Industry Council lobbied for legislation to give certainty to titles and for equitable mechanisms for the valid grant of future titles. It argued that the underpinnings of Australian commerce were at risk. At the same time, Indigenous leaders across the nation sought legislative recognition and protection of native title. And they took the decision to enter into negotiations with the government for legislation giving effect to Mabo No. 2. The Prime Minister, Paul Keating, reflecting on this process in 2011, said of these negotiations, never before had the Commonwealth of Australia and its cabinet or any earlier colonial government laid out a basis of consultation and negotiation, offering full participation in the country's Indigenous representatives, and certainly not around such a matter as important as the country's common law. In his reflections in this oration, the Lower Chair O'Donoghue oration, Paul Keating, who oversaw the negotiations, praised the role of Indigenous leaders in the debate. Had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders not stepped up to the plate, the substance and equity of the Native Title Act may never have materialised. In an instant, I was struck by the opportunity of the High Court decision and was determined to not see it slaked away in legislative neglect. 
But determined as I was, I needed partnership with Indigenous leaders to get it done and to get it done fairly. And so, in November 1993, the NTA was passed into Australian law and then promulgated in January 1994. Um, and the Prime Minister outlined the intention of the legislation in his second, speech, second reading speech, that it was an historic turning point and provided the basis of a new relationship between Indigenous and other Australians. The relevance of the Racial Discrimination Act is that first, it requires fair and just compensation to be paid for loss of native title after 1975. Failure to pay compensation will be racially discriminatory because other landholders are entitled to compensation. Second, the RDA is relied on to validate titles issued by the Crown. The Human Rights Commission stated this very clearly. Um, <coughs> Grants could be made without payment of compensation to native title to holders um, in the past, before the Native Title Act. At least that was as far as the common law was concerned. The court did not need to consider the effect of the racial discrimination on laws and grants. After 1975, um, the grant extinguished native title in a discriminatory way. And so it goes on. So the government could have been left with these issues for the courts to decide on a case by case basis, or at the other extreme, legislate for blanket validation of all past government acts to do with land. Instead, the Labor government of the day decided to focus on the potential invalid acts defined in a general way and leave any unresolved questions about the effect of valid acts on native title to the courts to resolve. And so native title has developed through the courts, um, sometimes with very great detriment to Aboriginal people, but at least legally and under a human rights framework. And so that is the new relationship with Indigenous Australians, or that is a part of it. So in 1993, the Government of Western Australia attempted a similar strategy as Queensland by passing its own native title law to account the effect of the Native Title Act and purported to extinguish native title in Western Australia and replace it with rights of traditional usage, which would be a form of statutory title. Again, the legislation was challenged, and in 1995 in Western Australia versus the Commonwealth, seven High Court judges confirmed that native title could exist in mainland Australia and found that the federal government had power under the Constitution to enact the Native Title Act. The court was also unanimous in finding that native title could only be extinguished in a manner that was consistent with the Racial Discrimination Act and the Native Title Act. In Brandy v. Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, a challenge to the constitutional validity of a scheme for enforcing human rights and equal opportunity commission decisions uh, was posed. The federal court made findings that established the conditions <coughs> uh, for the role of the commission, and particularly the Racial Discrimination Commission, in that the court found that the constitution forbids an administrative agency like the Commission from exercising any judicial power. The Commission's decisions were technically unenforceable. However, the Commission's legislation provided that a decision registered in the Federal Court would be enforceable as if it were a Federal Court order, unless it was successfully challenged within a, within a defined period. As a result, the Commission ceased to conduct hearings into complaints and establish procedures for investigating and conciliating complaints. All matters that require legal determination and enforcement must be taken to the Federal Court or Federal Magistrate Service. I turn now to the case involving the Adelaide Institute and the finding against it in Jones v Tobin. As the excellent summary of landmark cases uh, provided on the Human Rights Commission's website tells us, uh, in relation to the Racial Discrimination Act, in Jones v Tobin, 2002, in the Federal Court, 
The federal court found that certain documents on the Adelaide Institute website vilified Jews by imputing that there is serious doubt that the Holocaust occurred, that it is unlikely there were homicidal gas chambers at Auschwitz, that Jewish people who are offended by and challenge Holocaust denial are of limited intelligence, and that some Jewish people for improper purposes, including financial gain, have exaggerated the number of Jews killed during World War II and the circumstances in which they were killed. Dr Tobin did not submit a defence. The Executive Council of Australian Jury had complained to the Human Rights Commission about the website of the Adelaide Institute established by Dr Frederick Tobin. The Adelaide Institute posed as a scholarly centre of Holocaust research. The Council argued that it was anti-Semitic and vilified Jews. The complaint was referred to the Heriot Tribunal, which ordered the site to be dismantled. Mr Tobin failed to comply with the order, forcing Mr Jeremy Jones, President of the Council, to take the case to the Federal Court. The case was the first to apply the RDA's racial qualification provisions to the internet, and as you would know, the Adelaide Institute was forced to take down that website. In another interesting case that affects the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, or might be the Queen, the High Court addressed the legality of the alcohol management plan liquor restrictions imposed by the Liquor Act 1992 on Palm Island. The plaintiff, a resident of Palm Island, who was convicted of possessing an amount of alcohol above the limit, asserted that the liquor restrictions in the Act were racially discriminatory and therefore illegal applying as they did to Palm Island where the population is predominantly Indigenous. She asserted that these restrictions had affected her right to own property and were in breach of the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, although the majority of the members of the High Court did not dispute that the restrictions were racially discriminatory, they argued that they were justified under Section 8 of the RDA concerning special measures. The effect of this section, 8.1, again, <coughs> is that if, the, if a measure is a law, program or action in an area that is covered by the RDA and can be characterised as a special measure, it will not be racially discriminatory. Justice Keefel rejected the proposition that the provisions had a discriminatory effect on the rights of Indigenous persons to own property and said the right in question freedom to possess alcohol for consumption could not be characterised as a human right. She noted that the possession and consumption of alcohol had been restricted and controlled throughout Australia and internationally using various means for hundreds of years. This, demonstrated <coughs> this is demonstrated by the range of alcohol restrictions in force across Australia in both urban and regional locations where consumption of alcohol is prohibited or restricted in public spaces in which apply to all citizens. For the entire state of Queensland, it is an offence in all public areas to either drink or carry an open alcoholic beverage. And so there are other restrictions as well. So many political figures, especially in the Aboriginal community, the media and certain politicians, um, have regularly raised the right to drink argument when addressing the restrictions that Aboriginal people themselves want for the purposes of maintaining health and good order and minimising harm and violence. Justice Crennan, in relation to the Maloney case, noted the human right of fundamental freedom sought to be protected is the right of Aboriginal persons on Palm Island, in particular women and children, to a life free of violence, harm and social disorder brought about by alcohol abuse. In the case of Lottman being the state of Queensland, in 2016, the Federal Court decision awarded declaratory relief and damages to plaintiffs. Again, the Racial Discrimination Act proved to be a robust law that is capable of providing redress for injustice based on racial discrimination. In one summary provided by a law firm, it noted that the case is unusual because in an environment where few class actions go to hearing and even fewer go to judgment and are then decided in favour of the plaintiff, the outcome of this case is significant. It is particularly significant given the unusual nature of the claims, the fact that the claim was against the state and that damages were awarded. This case is about the role played by race in the Queensland Police Service response to the death of a man known posthumously as Mr Mulrungi in police custody on Palm Island. 
and the conduct of police officers on Palm Island in November 2004 in response to community protests and riot in reaction to his death. Were, uh, the court was asked to decide whether the police uh, investigation into Mal Runge's death in the management of the community's concerns, tensions and anger on Palm Island in the week after his death and in the police responses to protests and fires that occurred in November of whether those officers of the Queensland Police Service contravened Section 9.1 of the Corrosion Discrimination Act. The applicants claimed that the police officers conducted themselves differently because they were dealing with an Aboriginal community and the death of an Aboriginal man. Of course, the Commissioner denied all the applicants' allegations. However, in 2018, the Queensland Government agreed to pay Palm Islanders $30 million in an agreement with the community. The agreement came 14 years after Mr Dumaji, or Mr Mulrungi, died of massive internal injuries after he was arrested for being drunk and locked in a police cell with no visible injuries at the time. As part of the settlement, the State Government also agreed to offer an apology, and the settlement includes payments for 447 claimants as well as interest, legal and administrative costs. Mr Lex Watton, who was convicted of inciting the riots following the death of Mr Mulrungi in custody, launched the legal action in 2015, um, and his own family, of course, were affected by what had occurred. The case is a representative uh, proceeding, and the three applicants brought the proceeding as representatives of a group of people affected. They alleged unlawful racial discrimination. Um, and they also brought the proceeding on behalf of a subgroup of people who were affected by an operation carried out by armed officers of the Special Emergency Response Team. The subgroup includes children who were in or near houses that were entered and searched by armed CERT officers. So, the Deputy Premier, the Honourable Jackie Trad, and Attorney General and Minister for Justice, the Honourable Yvette Duff, announced that their government was endeavouring to work with the Palm Island community in a fitting way to recognise this historic apology. We see each of the cases I've mentioned, although I've not included very many of the 100 cases that could be discussed, but the RDA has been fundamental to the equal treatment of the plaintiffs in dealings with the states and their agencies. Without the RDA, the vulnerability of those people seeking justice, relief from racial vilification and discrimination and remediation would be so much more difficult, if not impossible. In the absence of explicit rights under our Constitution, this Act, along with similar state legislation, provides a bulwark against the abuse, discrimination and denial of fundamental rights of access to services and equal treatment. However, whilst the RDA has proved important in protecting Australians <coughs> from racial and other uh, discrimination by the states, it does not provide protection from the exercise of racially discriminatory legislation by the Commonwealth, as George Williams has observed. Even the Racial Discrimination Act has proved a fragile shield. Few people realise that it has been overridden twice in the past decade. Hence, Indigenous leaders have, over many decades, sought constitutional recognition of our status as First People and protection of that status, our cultures and languages. Following many inquiries and committees and disappointment after disappointment with successive governments handing on this responsibility to the next to make a decision about a referendum on this question, there is a people's movement building across the country in support of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that deals directly with this problem of the exemption of the Commonwealth from the standards of the RDA, especially in relation to the treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This is a topic for another lecture, but I believe that our constitutional history and the history of the RDA, along with the legal impact on Indigenous peoples, warrant constitutional entrenchment of the rights of acknowledgement of us as First People, First Peoples and a voice to Parliament provide an Indigenous body to consider and advise on, on matters such as each of the landmark cases involved in the RDA that I've discussed here. 
Section 18 of the RDA has proved an effective measure of deterring vilification, while also enabling matters to be conciliated. Some of the proceedings of the courts, and like so many other matters, become subject to the ways and highly contested. The complaints made about the RDA are often without grounds based in evidence or reason. You will remember that in 2014, the then Attorney General, the Honourable George Brandis, tabled in the Federal Parliament Freedom of Speech Bill, um, rep um, repealed Section 18C Bill. The Human Rights Policy Branch of the Attorney General's Department invited the public to make submissions on the bill, and many Australians did so, causing the government to withdraw the bill. The bill was to accede to demands by freedom of speech advocates and repeal sections of the RDA that deal with constant insult and humiliation that so many people, including Jewish people, other ethnic groups, and especially Indigenous people and people of colour, receive on a regular basis. This constant rhetoric is almost an Australian jargon, an embedded cultural characteristic of Australian life by Australians who would regard themselves as white, even more aggressively pursued by the representatives who want their racial supremacy reinstated and continue to call for the amendment and even repeal of the RDA. My views remain the same as those expressed in my submission on the 2014 bill. <clears throat> As the same arguments for the bill put by George Brandis have been argued um, by contributors to Quadrant Magazine and by members of the Institute of Public Affairs, it is worth repeating my reasoning for retaining the RBA in its present form for the purpose of preventing and remediating racial and other qualification. Sections A and C and D do not resolve in criminal charges. Costs are not awarded as they are in defamation cases. The RDA allows people to make complaints to the Commission about unlawful acts involving offensive behaviour because of race, colour or national or ethnic origin. This might involve conciliation leading to an apology. We can assume then the RDA had been, had been amended that the only recourse of people offended on, the ground, on those grounds uh, would be expensive defamation litigation if the statements were untrue and defamatory. And so I uh, <coughs> went on arguing against Brandis's proposition. Um, the bill would have made it impossible for vulnerable people or people without very large bank accounts to um, pursue some justice. And most alarmingly, um, for me, the reluctance of most victims to make formal complaints or to contact police compounds this problem of their vulnerability to increased attacks by those emboldened to behave in even more offensive and aggressive ways on public transport and in public places. This inevitable consequence of this bill would have undermined the success of multiculturalism and reconciliation in the Australian community and led to more crisis events such as the criminal rights. Events in St Kilda recently uh, are very similar. Brandis's view that racial vilification and opinions that might cause offence are not the same things. He said that the utterance of abusive uh, threatening words constitutes racial identification. Yet this is exactly what Judge Mordecai Bromberg found in the case of Etoc v. Holt. Quote, beyond the hurt and insult involved, I've also found that the conduct was reasonably likely to have an intimidatory effect on some fair-skinned Aboriginal people and in particular young Aboriginal persons or others with vulnerability in relation to their identity. Bolt found himself in the Federal Court in 2010 in relation to a string of posts entitled It's So Hip to Be Black, White is the New Black, and White Fellows in the Black. In this case, brought by nine Aboriginal people, Bolt was found to have contravened Section 18C of the RDA. The plaintiff sought an apology, legal costs, and in order that the articles not be republished, they did not seek damages. It is this case 
that is deemed by coalition policy to limit freedom of speech. This is not just about the right to offend, it is about access to the law. There will be deleterious impacts. If the proponents of them or amending or of amending or abolishing the RDA, such as the Institute of Public Affairs, succeed. New and unspecified provisions will have two effects. Their intent will be to reject Justice Bromberg's findings in the Bolt case, and the new provisions would not have uh, be capable of being used to prosecute any similar case in the future, and there would be no legal protection against offensive behaviour because of race, colour or national or ethnic origin in public. And we both have been free to continue to publish untrue statements, unless what those of them have the money to pursue a defamation case against him. I believe that Bolt, whether deliberately or deceptively, conflates two problems, and that there are very serious consequences of this conflation. He has suggested repeatedly that the insistence by most Aboriginal people on our right to identify as such and to maintain our cultural heritage is merely a bruise to obtain welfare and other benefits from the taxpayer. The issue of identification as Aboriginal must be separated from the question of what welfare and other benefits ought to flow to people who identify as Aboriginal. There are thousands of Aboriginal people who do not qualify for any of the special Aboriginal benefits, such as ABSTUDY, which is means tested, like most government social security and related payments, and yet proudly identify as Aboriginal. I am one of them. There is no financial benefit <coughs> in identifying as Aboriginal. And often there are disadvantages, such as Andrew Bolt's columns, as, and racism in the workplace, and various forms of racial discrimination, all of which we endure to maintain our identity. In the future, should Brandis's bill, or a bill like it, succeed, each case of the kind Bolt lost in the federal court would need to be litigated. The victims would be those without the resources to mount a defamation case, and the young, and especially people who do not speak English, and the poor would be the victims. <coughs> Threats to our standards of human rights grow each year. The RDA has worked well since it became law, and any perception that it has not can be attributed to the very poor understanding or deliberate misunderstanding misunderstanding, even among some of the legal community judi and judiciary, as well as the general population of the concept of race or of ethnicity or of the kinds of behaviour that might constitute racial discrimination or racial vilification or insult or humiliation or vilification on the grounds of race, ethnicity or national origin. The Act should not be amended or repealed, but rather there should be greater efforts to educate Australians to overcome the increasing incidence of racism and vilification. The Act also serves to maintain standards of tolerance and respect so that acts of violence are not tolerated. It has had, I believe, an overall civilising effect in shaping public debate to be less tolerant of abuse of others on the grounds of race, ethnicity or national origin and contributed to the goodwill amongst the now very culturally diverse Australian population. This tolerance of diversity is one of Australians Australia's great strengths, and it should not be weakened by the poorly conceived proposal put by Brandis and the Institute of Public Affairs. We have work to do, even though this act has served us well. The attacks on the Human Rights Commission, and especially the personal attacks on the commissioners, are not acceptable. We cannot expect the human rights framework and fragile protections of human rights laws that have been established since 1948 to serve us well unless we protect, maintain and strengthen the human rights institutional framework. I would like to thank the Jewish Holocaust Centre and the Jewish Community Council of Victoria for the invitation to be here with you. I would also like to thank the Jewish Holocaust Museum and Research Centre for the ongoing work of so many people, especially volunteers, for their courageous efforts to educate Australians about the Holocaust, to help prevent further acts of genocide, to reject any denial of the Holocaust as an event and to condemn all manifestations of religious tolerance, incitement, harassment and violence against persons or communities based on ethnic origin or religious belief. 
I would like to acknowledge the work of Benai Griff in Victoria in protecting civil and human rights and educating Australians. Finally, I want to raise with you two matters on which we should collaborate to strengthen the Australian commitment to tolerance and respect. One is the proposal for a national resting place in Canberra for the ancestral remains of thousands of Aboriginal people whose body parts were traded to serve scientific racism. I seek your support to the thousands of our ancestral remains that are stored in boxes in Canberra to have the dignity of being kept at this proposed national resting place and subject to a rigorous research program to find, if at all possible, their original families, clans and tribes so that they can be returned and interred according to the traditions and customs of their people. We aim to educate Australians and international visitors as to the history of Australia and the horrifying attitudes and beliefs that led to this practice of trading the body parts of our ancestors, often involved in murder, grave theft and other practices that one hopes are unacceptable and illegal today. The other matter is the need for a constitutional amendment to provide a voice for First Peoples in our parliamentary system. I commend the Uluru's statement from the heart that encapsulates the aspirations of the overwhelming majority of First Australians in relation to an honourable place for us in a future Australia. You will hear much about this proposition and the proposed referendum in the near future, and I trust that you will listen to our arguments with open hearts. I thank you for listening to me, and I look forward to the Australia in which all of us are treated with dignity, remain safe in our homes, schools and places of work, and share equally in the opportunities offered in this great country. Thank you.